Mystery man, strange and exotic sailor. What happened? Did your captain make you pregnant? <laughs> Screw you! <laughs> no, no, it's nothing like that. The ships were fine. It was before that. Two things. You remember, during the war, we did some bad things. And bad things happened to us. <laughs> war is where the young and stupid are tricked by the old and bitter into killing each other. I was very young. And very angry. Maybe that is no excuse. Roman? Roman! Ah! Are you sleeping, you fat no, fuck? No Come on! <laughs>
it probably would have been different, but it's not. So let's move on to the actual list. Like it should be obvious that Claude would end up so low on my ranking considering he's simply the silent protagonist. You could replace Claude with a stick of tofu and nothing about the story would really change. Actually that's wrong. It would be hilarious. Remember, no one messes with my girls. So keep your hands on the wheel. If you don't mess this up, maybe there'll be more work for you. Now get out of here. Grand Theft Auto 3 follows Claude after he's betrayed by his now ex-girlfriend Catalina during a bank heist and left for dead. Claude survives this, but is sentenced to prison. Luckily, he just so happens to be on the same convoy as an old Asian gentleman who is being kidnapped. And from there on, Claude essentially works for several more established criminals until he finally gets the chance to enact his revenge on Catalina and kills her. Like I said, you could replace Claude with Stick of Tofu and nothing would really change. There's no indicator whatsoever how Claude feels about anything he gets involved with. The people he works for just point and Claude does the thing. We don't even get little facial gestures indicating that he's either annoyed or intrigued by whatever his very bosses are saying. He just has this blank stare of a man that's been dead for so long. Also, I apparently found out that Claude doesn't actually get a name until San Andreas, so that kind of fucked me up a bit. Other than being some common criminal with Catalina for some years, the only other information we really get about Claude is that he used to be a racer from San Andreas, and that's how he met Catalina. I know it's really easy to put him so low, but I simply could not justify placing him higher than number 12 or anyone else for that matter. You would be forgiven if you've never really heard of this guy. Even as I was poking around, whenever people talked about best or favorite protagonist, Mike was often left out. Hell, I didn't even know about his existence until Suggestive Gaming's Grand Theft Auto Timeline video. Another really good video, you should totally give it a watch. But that's to be expected considering Grand Theft Auto Advance was released the same day as Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Yeah. It is. Good grief, he's naked! GTA Advance follows Mike as he, alongside his friend and partner in crime Vinny, are getting some cash together to leave Liberty City and try for better pastures elsewhere. However, this takes a nosedive when, during one final gig, Vinny ends up dying in the car explosion, along with their money. That part's important. With his friend dead and all his money gone, Mike has no choice but to investigate and find out who killed Vinny. Kind of like Claude, there's not really much to say about Mike. They're in kind of the same boat, with the main difference being that Mike can talk, and while he can't emote, no one in this game does. That essentially means we can get something out of him. Okay. Let's see. He's loyal. Um, doesn't really like being betrayed. That's pretty much it, and given the nature of most GTA protagonists, uh, he's pretty much a baseline character. Like Claude, he's meant to simply be the vessel for the story of who in the sea of criminals killed Pity. As I mentioned before, the only reason he's higher than Claude is just that he at least has some semblance of character. I love dramatized, organized crime media. And I don't know about anyone else, but I do like when Grand Theft Auto dabbles in that area. So Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories is up my alley, and Tony is a pretty cool character, with a massive drawback. So Liberty City Stories is a prequel to Grand Theft Auto 3 that first came out for the PSP. It follows Tony Cipriani, a somewhat minor character in Grand Theft Auto 3, but the main protagonist for this game, as he returns to Liberty City after going into hiding upon killing a made man under Salvatore's orders. However, when Tony returns, he practically has to reprove himself to Salvatore, despite him doing a very dangerous action. Killing a made man ain't no fucking joke, Salvatore. This plight of Tony is showcased in one fatal swoop during the introduction cutscene. Tony's a very loyal, very capable man, despite all of the crap that his mother spews at him. Give him a task, and he'll get it done. All he wants in return for these tasks is respect and proper compensation. Something he never gets. 
The entirety of Liberty City Stories is just Tony being everyone's little patsy, but them complaining that he either didn't get them out of trouble good enough, or he didn't truly prove himself to them. Tony gives a lot and gives nothing in return, though sometimes he has it coming. Like, Tony, when have you ever had to do shit like this to appease a confession priest? Like, think, my boy. Think. It high-key makes me wish that the story could have went in a direction where Tony usurped Salvatore, but given that Salvatore's got a meeting with Silent Death in a few years, according to the 3D verse canon anyway, complacency until then is the best Tony's got. Even though he's not the one that ordered Claude to kill Salvatore anyways, but moving on, Tony, your mother does not love you, please, for the love of yourself, move on. <laughs> A lot of people might get mad at me about this one. I don't know how people feel about Trevor nowadays. I told you earlier, I threw unbiasedness out the window and that means Trevor is number 11. Since Grand Theft Auto 5 features a trio of protagonists, allow me to just get into Trevor's part in the story. After a failed bank robbery that, to Trevor's knowledge, killed one friend and incarcerated another, Trevor finds himself living in Sandy Shores alongside his slaves Ron and Wade. He spends his time running the company he calls Trevor Phillips Industries, which dabbles in drugs and gun running, finding himself at odds with the likes of the Lost MC and the O'Neill Brothers, a family whose presence in an online heist confused the hell out of me because I thought they were all dead. He gets roped up into real trio shit after hearing about a jewel heist that reminds him a lot of Michael and proceeds to track this person down to find out, hey, it is Michael. Everything takes off for him there and by the end of the game, uh, he's there, I guess. I appreciate how Rockstar went about creating Trevor, but in the end, his character falls flat for me. All of this chaos just doesn't go anywhere. If anyone's familiar with Game of Thrones, you might know this quote. Half the Targaryens went mad, didn't they? What's the saying? Every time a Targaryen is born, the gods flip a coin. Trevor reminds me a lot of that quote, except instead of flipping a coin every time a Targaryen is born, a coin is flipped for every 10 seconds spent with Trevor. Like, Trevor hates being betrayed, but actively treats the people around him like shit to the point where they only hang around him out of fear for themselves and their loved ones. He's fully aware that this is the type of effect he has on people, and he likes that. And if that's the case, maybe stop fucking crying about being abandoned a lot. Trevor is like the Joker, but without any of the flair. Hell, even the Joker's chaotic outbursts have a reason. I like my chaotic characters, but Trevor's just not one of them. Full props to you if you enjoy him, but for me, everything about Trevor just seems rancid, and I'm not talking about his smell. TLDR, Trevor's entire character is just... <laughs> Ooh, I'm mentally ill. <laughs> I don't know, Rockstar, maybe next time just leave the indiscriminate violence and rampages at the drop of a dime to the players, cause it doesn't really work for characters. At least not protagonists. I kind of feel bad for putting Franklin at number 10, but in comparison to other protagonists, yeah Frank, I'm sorry. So Franklin's story within GTA 5 starts with him working alongside his childhood friend, Lamar, in a repo scam business, but Franklin, ever the ambitious one, wants more from the criminal lifestyle if he is going to be a criminal. This leads him to a chance encounter with Michael, and from then on, he gets roped up into the main story, which involves him dealing with Lamar's terrible life choices, working alongside two angry old white men, and assassination, all the while coming up pretty good for himself thanks to his newfound connections. By the end, he rallies Trevor and Michael to take out all their enemies so that the three can continue living their lives in... sorta... peace. Franklin's definitely my favorite when it comes to the unholy trio. He's the rational one compared to every person he hangs out with, whether it's Lamar, Trevor, Michael, or Chop. Franklin is the typical Grand Theft Auto protagonist, an ambitious gangster looking for a come up. In Franklin's case, he doesn't really care how. Oftentimes he may put up a fight if it's something he doesn't agree with, but it's not really a strong one. He's also very loyal, you're gonna hear that a lot, to people that don't really deserve it because all they do is whine about how he's abandoning them, and by that they mean not catering to their every whim like he used to. 
We all know people like that, and if you don't, you are either very good at setting and maintaining boundaries, or you're one of them. I can appreciate the growth of his surroundings, and him not really taking everyone's shit. That being said, the reason I put him so low is simply because Franklin is a reactionary character. And while that's not necessarily a bad thing, rarely does he ever actually take action on his own. Rather, he just lets people take in places and not in the let me guide you type way, but a sure I guess type of way. I'm also not really talking about cases where he doesn't really have a choice in the matter like working for Haynes. Franklin is basically a character that just has stuff happen to him. Even when him and Lamar were trying to start their forum gangster bit, it was mostly Lamar leading the charge and then Franklin scolding him, but then again, what the hell did you expect to happen when you let Lamar lead, Franklin? There's just a general lack of actual initiative from someone who wants more out of his lifestyle. And that's the main reason why I put him so low, because when you compare him to other protagonists, especially the ones that wanted more, that's where his faults lie. I'm easily amused by pretty colors, so it should not come to anyone's shock that Ballad of Gay Tony was my favorite DLC of the episodes from Liberty City's duology. Luis, on the other hand, could have used a little more work in the character department though, at least I think so. Unfolding alongside the stories of both Nico and Johnny Klebitz, Ballad of Gay Tony does not actually star Gay Tony as the protagonist you play as. Actually, you play as his bodyguard and friend, Luis Lopez. Tony has been racking up debt to the Ancelotti crime family to keep his clubs open, and Luis helps him keep his head above water. By the end of the story, rather than stabbing Tony in the back, like many people they come across urged him to, Luis stays steadfast in his loyalty to Tony, essentially giving Liberty City the finger. The story summary I just gave is literally one of the main reasons I love Luis. I'm going to be throwing around the word loyalty a lot, but Luis is one of those protagonists that truly had the back of those they care about. There's a real love when it comes to Luis helping not just Tony, but also his childhood friends, despite the fact that they are just leading a life that he doesn't really agree with. Which leads me to another point. Luis is cool. A lot of times, the protagonist can be hella judgmental for literally no reason. Like, if you're stuck with this person, that's one thing, but some of the protagonist's sense of obscure righteousness is just like, uh, no one asked you, dude. Luis is the opposite. I can see Luis's friendship with his friends as a better version of Lamar and Franklin. Because the Lamars in question aren't imbeciles who do nothing but talk shit about their friend doing better, but also that the Franklin understands that his Lamars don't have access to the same opportunity the way he did, so he helps them with their gigs and ambitions. The main area Luis falls flat in is that he's a character that could only really shine when he's with someone else, and that could be forgiven considering he's essentially meant to be the blue to Tony's red. But in the end, that kind of leaves us with a character that absolutely needs to be paired with someone in order to be even the slightest bit interesting. Which is funny considering that Rockstar pulled it off really well with Nico. but what else? Moving on. Despite Lost in a Dam not really being one of my favorite of the Grand Theft Auto 4 stories, I think Johnny is really cool in his own right. A story that plays alongside GTA 4's main story and Ballad of Gay Tony, The Lost and Dam follows Johnny Clevis as he does his damnness to keep his crew, the Lost MC, afloat during a rather troubling period. Between botched heroin deals, a war between their rivals revamping, a civil war within the motorcycle club brewing, and his ex-girlfriend needing to be bailed out constantly through depths old to a variety of totally not sketchy folks, I can low-key see how Johnny became what he is in Grand Theft Auto V. The ending of The Lost in the Dam sees Johnny and what's left of his club burning down their clubhouse and leaving LC for greeter pastures. Huh. I can appreciate Johnny being a character that's not a leader, but can take up the reins when it's needed especially in a Grand Theft Auto game. Unfortunately for Johnny, he was dealt a shitty hand when it came to picking up the pieces of everyone else's problems. He's kind of stuck cleaning up really, really big problems. I personally just don't think Johnny was cut out for the criminal biker life. He's way more cool-headed than his more high-strung clubmates. It's something that puts him at a clash with their president, Billy Gray. 
Especially once Billy's out of rehab and doesn't like how Johnny's been handling things. But that just leads to another good point about Johnny, is that he thinks ahead and not in the moment. At least not to the same length that other members of his club would. I do like how Johnny has a realistic-ish view when it comes to the criminal lifestyle. Like, sure, he knows he's the type that can totally kill someone in cold blood, but if it's not needed, then it's not needed. Again, going back to his tendency to think things through. If there's one thing Johnny definitely needed to work on, is setting some strong boundaries, because the fact that he's back together with Ashley in GTA 5 after seemingly cutting her off is just sad. Johnny's kind of tragic when you think about it, especially considering the next time we see him, he gets brutally killed off by Trevor. Why did that happen? I went a while without knowing about Chinatown Wars since at the time, and when I actually learned about it, your best chance of playing it was either through the DS or the PSP, one of which I didn't have and the other... Metagrim Fate. When it came to gaining some traction, it didn't really do well. Not as bad as Advance, but still underwhelming according to Rockstar, which sucks because a lot of people praise the little extra mechanics that the game had that worked with the DS at the time. The story of Chinatown Wars follows Huang Li on his way to Liberty City in order to deliver his now deceased father's sword, Yu Jian, to his uncle Kenny Wu in order for Kenny to give it to the leader of the Liberty City Triad, Sin, in order to ensure that Kenny can become Sin's successor when he eventually retires. Did you get all that? However, this goes wrong when upon landing in LC, he's Im immediately ambushed by some unknown gangsters who leave from the dead and steal the sword. Kenny's obviously pissed about this, so Huang goes around Liberty City looking for whoever tried to have him killed and who stole the sword. Spoilers, it was the uncle the entire time. It's me, Austin! Oh, son of a bitch! As much as I would love to talk about the villains, I'm going to save whatever I have to say about their plans for whenever I do my GTA Villains video. So back to Wong. Wong actually reminds me a little bit of Nico in that he's not really investing in the games that everyone around him is playing. And he can sort of see past all of the bullshit. Wong is surrounded by people who spout things like honor and tradition, specifically his uncle Kenny, which is very ironic. Quan knows that it's all talk and he would much prefer just getting to the point. He's also got some fair priorities in order and I can respect that about a character cause damn, that would be my reasoning 100% as well. I can't even lie. Quan's also a sass little bitch and it's hilarious because a lot of the people he encounters speak like they're above him and it takes them down a peg. And that would make you, no doubt, the big, tough, stupid one. You take that back or I'll kill you! Alright, alright, you're not tough. That's better! Wait, didn't you- Give him a minute. Hey! Despite how he may feel about the way his family puts values on things like tradition, he's still very loyal to both his Uncle Kenny and to his late father, despite how he feels about the way he lived his life up until his death. Even after having to kill his uncle, he's still torn up about it considering he had to take out what's left of his biological family. I mean, gee, thanks, and I guess that makes everything better. I can admit though that because I never really got a chance to enjoy Chinatown Wars, that my connection to Wong isn't as strong as a lot of other folks, but I do like his character a lot and I wish Chinatown Wars was able to get more love. At least enough to where Rockstar would introduce some of the mechanics from the game to their, you know, I guess you would want to say more mainstream console games. Alright, I'm gonna say it, the theme to Vice City Stories does not slap as hard as Vice City's does. It had to be said, and that is the hill I'm dying on. You can fight me on it. Much in the same vein that Liberty City Stories was a prequel to Grand Theft Auto 3, Vice City Stories was a prequel to Vice City. It follows Victor Vance, the guy that gets shot at the beginning of Vice City, and Lance's older brother, as he falls into the criminal lifestyle thanks to his piece of shit superior getting him sacked with a dishonorable discharge. I'd say out of all of the protagonists, there's a general softness when it comes to Victor Vance. He's not really made for the criminal lifestyle. As mentioned previously, he's just kind of thrust into the life, but he wasn't bad at it by any means. His only real partner in the whole ordeal was his dumbass of a brother. Seriously, if you hated Lance at Vice City, you'll despise him by the end of Vice City stories. 
At his core, Vic Vance is a family man, not just to his own family, but to the bonds he creates with other people. I would say especially when it comes to the lease, aside from Caesar and Kendall's romantic relationships in San Andreas, we don't really see a lot of decent romantic romps for the protagonist. Nico and Kate's relationship is short-lived, canonically, which sucks because they have potential. Michael and Amanda's relationship is rocky as hell. Johnny should have been ditched Ashley's behind. I'm pretty sure CJ and Claude were hostages when it came to Catalina, and Tommy and Mercedes, while having cute interactions, they never actually become a thing. It's something that helps make Vic stand out and really allows his softness to be put on such a stage. Not only that, but his reasons for joining the army in the first place were pretty much so he can get money that he needs to provide for his family, especially his younger brother Pete. He's also apparently really easy to get along with so long as you're not some sort of asshole, which, you know, it's actually pretty easy because I'm not an asshole. My only issue with Vic, and it's pretty small, but he's one of those characters that's like, drugs destroy people's lives, but I'm also the one who's selling drugs type characters, and that is so annoying to me. It's not like even he's coming from a warped, I'd rather people buy from me area, and there's like this strong disconnect when it comes to that. It's either annoyingly hilarious or hilariously annoying. One of those is the proper way to describe it. So there's no real sugarcoating, a lot of Grand Theft Auto fans are pretty much at terms with the fact that Vice City is kinda... Scarfacey? With the main difference being the ending. Despite that, it literally does not take away from Vice City stories one bit. So Vice City tells the story of Tommy Brissetti, a member of the Ferrelli crime family who was sentenced to prison 15 years ago after killing several men in a hit that turned into an ambush. In order to keep the heat off the family, Sonny Ferrelli sends him down to Vice City so the family could get in on the rising drug trade happening in the city. Things go wrong when, once again, Tommy finds himself ambushed with the money and drugs stolen and he's stuck in Vice City to find out who did it before Sonny comes to Vice City. This quickly turns into Tommy Brissetti taking control of Vice City, something that Sonny doesn't take too lightly. Tommy leaves with the Ferrelli gang and forms his own, eventually taking Sonny out and becoming an undisputed kingpin of Vice City. Some might say Tommy's character is pretty basic, but I don't really see anything wrong with that. Especially considering what was meant for this character to begin with, in that while Grand Theft Auto 3 was more about showcasing that the series was ready for the realm of 3D, Grand Theft Auto Vice City was meant to give us more of a speaking character with a story that heavily involved him. I casually forgot to mention this, but Sonny was the reason that Tommy got arrested back then. At first he wanted Tommy dead, but then Tommy survived, he went to jail. The reason behind it being that Sonny was jealous about the growth that Tommy was gaining within the family. A fear and jealousy that was well warranted, something we see throughout the entire game. Tommy is fully capable of getting the job done, and it makes it worse because he's someone who prefers to do it himself, but he knows that others will screw it up somehow. Case in point, Lance. It's something that gives him an edge over his competition, who see themselves as too important to do the dirty work. His most notable trait being that he's intelligent, which is actually pretty cool considering that a lot of NPCs aren't really dumb like in other games. Tommy's just better at outsmarting them and taking them out. And his other notable trait is his anger issues, and I don't know, maybe it's just me because so many characters often have short tempers to begin with, so it feels pretty meh, but nothing about Tommy really screams anger issues. Especially when you consider the people he's around. I know I said they're not really dumb, but they are eccentric. He's also really a character that has some hints of softness, something that was mostly shown with the character of Ernest Kelly. The phone calls between him and Mercedes are small little treats, or maybe I only really think that because she's played by Feruza Balk. Now that I think about it, a lot of the characters in Vice City aren't really that bad. No. Except for you. I hate you. San Andreas really came out in 2004. What is time? San Andreas is definitely the Grand Theft Auto entry that made a lot of people's childhood. At the time, it was Rockstar's most ambitious entry and it still can do all that they wanted the game to do. 
some were for the greater good because, let's be honest, the existence of hot coffee was just Rockstar being horny on Maine. I remember my dad and brother and I were excited because we were going to play as a black person and that the vibe was just going to, well, generally be black. San Andreas follows Carl Johnson, also known as CJ, as he returns to his home of San Andreas after spending five years in Liberty City upon hearing about the death of his mother, Beverly Johnson, who was killed in a drive-by that was actually targeting his older brother, Sue. He comes back home to find that his neighborhood gang, the families, are shattered remnants of what they once were, so he decides to stay behind and help his brother and childhood friends rebuild their gang against their longtime rivals, the Ballas. And CJ? Honey? You've got a big storm coming. I feel like CJ was the start of a lot of later protagonists having more fleshed out human sides to them. Starting with the main fact that we simply get more about who CJ is and where he's from and his relationships with the people around him, mainly his family and childhood friends. I feel like CJ is one of the more compassionate GTA protagonists. I say that because he's often showing a hesitance to kill and always trying to give someone an out. Unless they slighted him, or his family, or someone he considers a friend. Except for like, this guy, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess he was just trying to play him, maybe turn him against Sam Penny, but like, I don't know, it just feels weird. He's definitely more on the naive side when it comes to, well, a lot of things. He needs to have a lot of things spelled out for him very clearly. Like, I know Crash likes to fuck with him and the others a lot, but he had to have been a little bit suspicious of the fact that Crash was always coming out of Smoke's house whenever he came by. Ryder, yeah, maybe that was shocking, but Big Smoke should have at least warranted a, I had my suspicions. Despite the naivete, he's surprisingly really good at being a businessman, which makes me believe that it simply was that the gang life was not something specifically for him. A lot of the high tier gangster shit and shady business dealings are more up his alley, which just goes to show you that you can't judge a fish by how well it climbs a tree. Much like Vic, CJ's a family man, and also like Vic, most of the things he gets involved with are to protect his family, especially after Sweet's locked up and him and Kendall are out living in the boonies after the great betrayal. Though, I think he should gain a little backbone when dealing with Sweet, cause Sweet be talking a lot of shit for someone who relying on his little brother to practically raise the families from the dead. I don't know, that might just be me though. <laughs> So Michael lucks out considering he's way higher than his buddies. Even though I like Franklin and he's like my favorite of the trio, his whole bad reactionary character thing kind of makes him fall flat in comparison. Michael, in my opinion, has the best solo character arc of the game's story. For me, it's definitely fulfilling in a way that Franklin and Trevor's stories just aren't. Michael's arc in the storyline essentially tells the story of a former bank robber unhappy with his current life of wealth and misses his glory days. Is your typical, woe is me, I feel so lonely in my big house in Rockford Hills. I'm sorry, unless a wealthy character is being straight up abused, it's hard for me to feel sorry for a wealthy character and their emptiness. Michael's life goes from empty to anxiety inducing after he thinks he's pulled down the house of his wife's paramour. He worried. Thanks! It turns out the house didn't belong to the tennis coach, but in fact a prominent Los Santos kingpin by the name of Martin Madrazo. Who is rightfully pissed and tells Michael that he has to fork up the money for rebuilding the house. This is how Michael ends up in the jewel heist and how he ends up in the sights of the FIB, who force him, Franklin, and Trevor to do their bidding. Throughout the game, Michael loses his family, gets chased out of Los Santos, becomes a movie producer, goes to family therapy, rekindles some family relationships, fights off the private army invaded in his home, robs more stuff, and honestly, like I said, he's the only one with a fulfilling character arc. I really like that the game doesn't really paint Michael as the victim. Him being the victim is just something that a lot of the fanbase went with. Amanda's a slut because she cheated on Michael. Michael cheats on her too. Optional, yeah, but it's also implied that he's canonically cheated on her before. His kids are brats. Yeah, that's kind of what happens when you don't actually parent your kids. And Michael knows this himself. He knows that a lot of the things he's complaining about in his life are either partly his fault or completely his fault. And he hates that he's aware of this, especially because by the beginning of the game, he's in the mindset that he won't actually do anything about it except spend a shit ton of money for a shitty therapist who doesn't actually help him with anything. But it doesn't stay that way. In fact, the part where he loses his family and ends up stuck with Trevor and Stockholm Syndrome Patricia Madrazo 
is the turning point he needed to actually better his life and actually try with his family outside of smashing TVs and complaining. That is what we call growth. <laughs> Yeah, Nico is my number one. I'm putting him at the top of the ranking. Grand Theft Auto 4 went under my radar for a long time when it came out, which is funny because it would have made a great birthday gift. We follow Nico Bellic, a former soldier in the Yugoslav Wars who ended up working in the European criminal underworld, particularly under a man named Ray Bulgarin and his human trafficking ring. However, after a botched job where Nico was the only survivor, he took the opportunity to escape the US to not only finally see his cousin Roman's lavish American lifestyle, but to also find the man who betrayed his infantry group back during the Yugoslav Wars. Things quickly go wrong when not only does Nico find out that Roman was lying about his fabulous American lifestyle, but is also in debt to several gangsters, who Nico has to help Roman deal with despite Roman's pleas for Nico to let it go. Of course, taking out one well-connected fish in the criminal underworld leads to having to deal with bigger fish than that, and so while trying to escape his life as a criminal in Europe, he ends up becoming a criminal in the US, and having his crimes in Europe come back to haunt him like a screwed up family reunion. I think my favorite thing about Nico is that he can see past the bullshit that's being thrown at him, no matter who he's interacting with, family included. Obviously, it's all due to how his life transpired up to this point, and how it continues to transpire when trying to make a new life for himself. However, what I really like about it is that this cynicism doesn't get in the way of his compassion, something that even people in real life always allow to happen. Because of his life experiences, he's fully aware of everyone else's hardships, something that a lot of other characters within his story fail to do. In my opinion, this is a part of what makes him the straight man to everyone else, who we are often wrapped up in their own little bubbles to consider anyone else's hardship or feelings. Think of Mikael, think of Brucey, think of Francis. In terms of his compassion, well, yeah, a lot of the let so-and-so live are choices, I don't really have any doubts that the decisions like letting Darko live, killing Playboy X, and killing Francis over Derek are canon to his story. And if they're not, then they will still make the most sense to me given how we see Nico act as a character and his current views in life. Yeah, part of the reason he came to Liberty City was to find out who exactly betrayed their group and killed them, but as time goes on in the story, what would be the point, right? Sure, maybe if at the beginning he knew exactly who did it and where they were, he probably would have killed Darko. But by the time the mission rolls around, his head is probably a bit clearer than that. Maybe his growth is not as out there and upfront as Michael's, at least to some people, but it's there, and I don't really want to say he was rewarded for the growth because. But he does end up in a better place than where he was when he first arrived in Liberty City. Maybe he didn't end up living in a luxury condo with a sports car, or Barbara with the big titties, and Stephanie who sucks like a vacuum. But he's better off. Being referred to as someone who's gone quiet is actually the ending that Nico really needed when he came to the US. It's just a shame that he couldn't share a life with Kate, because they would have been really cute together. 